Okay, so now we're on to looking at an example inquiry report. So one of the things that you hopefully can uh, can master pretty easily for this is the formatting. So one of the things that you'll be assessed on is your ability to create an response, which is assessment objective five. Now this says that the features of the report are re report the report genre are consistently demonstrated with a cover and contents page, headings and subheadings. So of course there are other aspects to in terms of this creating a response thing, but um, this is something that you can hopefully get pretty easily. So some cover page inclusions, you've got your um, the type of the report, so inquiry report in this case, you've got the title, mine was called Press Freedom in Australia, you've got the purpose of the report, this is similar to the introduction with outlining what it is about. You've got the word count range and you've got the date as well. Now, zooming in on the table of contents, you'll see that this is really similar to that structure that I outlined earlier. In my case, I had subheadings underneath that nature and scope idea because there are multiple aspects to explore. So um, dividing those up into logical sections is always handy to make it more readable. In terms of the stakeholder perceptions aspect, I chose to go with the alternative where I speak about all of the stakeholders to begin with, the ones that are affected, and then I zoom in on two and look at their viewpoints specifically. In terms of legal alternatives, I've got those two headings with um, what the alternatives are and then my recommendations, my conclusion and my reference list. So if you're working in Word or Google Docs, no matter what kind of uh, application you're using, make sure that you use your um, headings. So your heading one, heading two, etc., and that can help you then generate your table of contents. So we'll now go through and have a look at um, a copy of the different uh, paragraphs that I had as part of my report. And I encourage you to have a look at this in more detail in your own time to read it in full and keep in mind that this is going to be uh, different to what you'll be doing. Uh, this was years ago now uh, for me, so your report will not be on the same thing more than likely, but it can give you an indication of how you can structure and approach yours. So in this introduction, I have outlined what press freedom actually is. That is the, um, that is the topic of my report. And then I clearly state what the report will do. So it's going to examine the nature and scope of the legal issue of press freedom in Australia. And uh, it's going to discuss recent legislative changes, st stakeholder perceptions, legal alternatives, and a final recommendation is provided. Okay, so in nature and scope, uh, the first section is press freedom. So um, I outline an example to start with. So I'm looking at Annika Smithhurst and how uh, her she had her home invaded or raided um, because of this idea of uh, she reported on something that um, that they were concerned about national security, so they wanted to to find out where she got her information from. You can see at the end here of this paragraph, I've got uh, so I've got my sources in brackets, and you can have a superscript at the end of a 
sentence and you can see what that looks like. It's like a little flying kind of number. If you're having, uh, if you think of maths where you've got um, a number that's squared or cubed, it's that kind of uh, floating number. Um, and a superscript is a footnote, um, which is at the end of your report, it appears. Um, or an end note appears at the end of the report and a footnote appears at the foot or the bottom of each page. Um, and it contains some more information. So in this case, my footnote said, um, for such actions, Miss Smethers could face prosecution under Section 79 of the Crimes Act 1914. So I was also adding more relevant information about the nature and scope of the current laws and the current situation. So I've provided that example and I wanted to provide a little bit of extra information about um, how that those current laws apply to that example that I've given. Here I provide more examples. So there, um, uh, as I said in that earlier introduction, there had been lots of examples of uh, things related to press freedom in that year in 2019. So I've provided some more examples here. And I've also looked at um, at something related, I suppose, to overseas with uh, this idea of uh, Mimi Mifu and her visa being denied. Um, because of uh, them not being satisfied that her employment and financial situation provide an incentive to return to Australia. So continuing on from that, uh, you can see in yellow here, we've got the idea of the legal concept or the principle and some legal terminology as well. So I've provided some information about, um, about Christian Porter, the Attorney General at the time. He ordered that the Director of Public Prosecutions seek his direct written approval before journalists um, were prosecuted for alleged offences. Um, and then I have analysed this. I'm not just saying what is happening, but I'm thinking about what this means from that legal principle viewpoint. And I've said this requirement is not aligned with the principles of the separation of powers and interferes with the implied right of press freedom in the Australian Constitution. Um, so you can see here how it's important to not only just list examples and list things that are happening, but also look at it in more detail and what it means. Some more, so we've got citing some relevant legislation. So the Telecommunications and Other Legislation Amendment Act 2018, um, and this other amendment, Data Retention Act as well, uh, impede on journalists' code of ethics. And in blue, we've got some analysis and an explanation of how that legislation impedes on the codes of ethics. So you want to not only just make claims, but support those claims with some evidence as well. It's like a persuasive speech in English where it's far um, higher level and far more, um, far more sort of credible if you not only make statements and claims, but then um, support those with, with the evidence to back it up. So I am citing the MEAA Journalist Code of Ethics. Um, I'm stating some information about other legislation and um, what that means in terms of this, this idea of impeding journalists' code of ethics. And 
I zoom in as well. I say the data retention amendment particularly comprises the obligations of journalists, uh, allowing 22 government agencies to access metadata without a warrant. So note here that there's two other subheadings in this nature and scope section that um, I haven't included in these slides. So we are now moving on to the next section. So stakeholder perceptions. I started off with a paragraph about the stakeholders who were effective, uh, affected by the situation. Um, I list a whole bunch of those. Um, and that is a way of also analyzing that nature and scope too. Um, I define a key stakeholder. So I journalists are a key stakeholder here and I provide that definition of who they actually are in this case, um, explaining how legislation affects them and how this relates to the legal issue of press freedom. So they are a predominant stakeholder in the national security amendment laws as they risk being indicted with an unauthorized disclosure offense for reporting on particular information and this presents a threat to journalists' sources and thereby press freedom in Australia. And this is continuing on from that. I also name and define another stakeholder. Um, so I'm talking about Australia's National Security Agency, the Australian Security Intelligence Organization, and then I again explain how the legislation affects them and how it relates to the issue. Try to, uh, like in English, how you constantly need to refer back to a thesis statement that you would have um, introduced earlier um, in your introduction. In this, you want to make sure that you're, you've constantly got the relevance to what you're talking about. So anything that you say, try and relate it back to the issue that you're focusing on. You don't want to get off track and too far away from the topic at hand. And then I've got another heading with the different viewpoints of stakeholders. So I've provided that detailed outline of who all the stakeholders are, um, how they're defined, how they're affected. And then I've got this more of a summary paragraph um, to, to just zoom in particularly on the viewpoints of the two stakeholders that I'm focusing on. Next section is the legal alternatives to reform the law. The first one that I've got is a Media Freedom Act. So again, making sure that it's a legal alternative, not just a, a recommendation that is not legally binding. So start off by clearly stating the legal alternative so it's really clear. Um, explain the advantages of the alternative, um, explain how it could work. You could also delve into possible disadvantages if there are any as well. And that is something that I did do here. Um, oftentimes, since you're suggesting these legal alternatives, there's probably going to be more advantages to talk about than disadvantages, one would hope. Uh, but there often will be disadvantages to discuss as well. And my second alternative, a federal charter of rights. And you can see the level of detail that you want to go into there as well. In the recommendations section, I first off state an advantage of the legal alternatives that I am not choosing. So while a Media Freedom Act may be useful in the immediate future, a federal charter of rights is the most advantageous reform alternative. So I'm clearly stating that chosen legal alternative rather than sitting on the fence. Um, and you can do that the way that I've done it. So you are um, recognizing a benefit of the other one that you're not choosing if, um, if there is one in your case. Next up, I explain why this alternative is better than the other one. And then 
I finish off by providing um, another interrelated legal recommendation and some supporting supporting reasoning. Um, so if your legal alternative comes with possible concerns, so in this case, concerns about the restrictions of a Charter of Rights, um, that this idea of parliamentary sovereignty, um, I suggest using the dialogue model belonging to the Victorian Charter. So if you're making further recommendations, make them like sub-recommendations to the one that you've already said. So here I have, um, I've suggested the Charter of Rights and then I'm making further recommendations about how that could actually work to address some concerns that may exist around that. And then I finish off with a conclusion um, this is really quite short. You will have covered most of that important information earlier. So you're just uh, summarizing here with um, showing the importance of um, the change and uh, what the change is. And our last question for today. So use your research skills to find a case law example on drug possession that was heard in the Queensland Supreme Court. Name the case and the date. So we'll have a look soon at some examples of places that you can go to help you in that kind of research. So.